Now, our tradition has not done this parable any favors. It has given this parable the title, the parable of the prodigal son. The parable did not originally come with a title. Now, Bishop, I have nothing against titles. Titles, <laughs> titles are helpful. But I tell you, titles can also be harmful and dangerous. Titles can name a story, a good story, and cage it and mislead us into thinking that just because we have named the thing, we know everything there is to know about it. Titles tend to domesticate and tame good stories until those good stories become easy and mundane and impotent. Stories like this do not have a title because titles can make us lazy and complacent. A parable is a parable because it cannot be managed or contained by a simple title. Parables are like people. You can't just title them, label them, and think you can manage them. Show me a managed parable, and I will show you a dead parable. An Australian friend of mine, Cameron Simmons, he writes great poetry, and he has one poem that he has allowed me to use often. It is a wonderful poem that, for me, is the best definition of a parable. Cameron's poem goes like this. This poem is untitled. This poem has no title. This poem wants no title. This poem rebels against any appropriate, feasible, and or logical title that you may happen to think of. The first line of this poem is not to be supplemented as a title. It is not even to be referred as the poem that is untitled, or that untitled poem, or untitled. It is to have no name, heading, or abbreviated term, or reference of any type, and this poem poem upholds the God-given right to remain untitled. If it is ever to be referred to, it is to be recited in its entirety and read with all sincerity. This poem is untitled, is never to be titled, and shall not ever have a title. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Jesus tells a parable. A parable without a title. It is a story about a family. By assigning this parable, the title, the parable of the prodigal son, shifts attention from the family and privileges one member of the family as though the whole story is about that one member. This is a Jesus parable. This is not a Hollywood production where there has to be one star and everyone else is supporting cast. Families do not work that way. Families are much more complex than a title would suggest. In his story, the younger son decides to leave home. We are not told why he decides to leave home. There's plenty of room to speculate on the circumstances surrounding his leaving. We only know that he left in a manner that reveals he was not planning to come back. What he could not pack and take with him, he had a rummage sale. He withdrew his savings, he closed his account, he tore up his bank book, and he had a talk with his old man. And the talk must have broken his father's heart. He said, Dad, it's like this. If there's anything you were planning to leave me in your will, count yourself dead to me. I'll take it now. In writing about this story, Kenneth Bailey writes, the younger son's requests his inheritance while his father is still alive and in good health. In traditional Middle Eastern culture, this means, Father, I am eager for you to die. This young son makes a request that is unthinkable, particularly in the Middle Eastern culture, 
And if the father is a traditional Middle Eastern father, he will strike the boy across the face and drive him out of the house. And the surprise of the story for Jesus' first century hearers would be that the father does not refuse the outrageous request, the outrageous insulting request. The father grants his youngest son the freedom to own and to sell his portion of the estate. And whatever piece of the farm his father gave him, his inheritance, the younger son sold it. Did you hear that? He sold the land. He gave ownership of his father's land to another family. This is horrendous. It is one thing to desire to leave, but selling a piece of the farm, moving the boundaries, making the family's problems public knowledge, shaming the family before the entire community. Jewish law of the first century, we are told, provided for the division of the inheritance when the father was ready to make such a division, but did not grant the children the right to sell until after the father's death. Although the father allows this, society has its own rules of dealing with such a boy. The writings of the Jerusalem Talmud and the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that Jewish communities of the time of Jesus had a method of punishing such a boy who lost the family inheritance, especially to Gentiles. It was called the Ketzatza Ceremony, Q E T S A T. S-A-H, Ket Sat Sa. You can Google it, it's in there. <laughs> you see, what the younger son did violated not just his family, but the entire community. And the community figured if such a younger son decided to leave, he better be gone for good. He better not dare return to the home village. And if he did, he would face the Ketzatza ceremony. What's the Ketzatza ceremony? Seems it was simple enough. The villagers would bring a large earthenware jar. I stopped by Walmart and got one. something like that, and they would fill it with burned nuts and wheat, and then they would break it in front of the, of the guilty individual, while they would say, so and so is cut off from his people, and they would throw it and smash it in front of him. From then on, the village would have nothing to do with the wayward lad. It was a total ban of any contact with this violator of the village code of honor. You see, villages have to protect themselves. Society has to protect itself from the younger son syndrome. The, the way I see it is this younger son syndrome can catch and infect the entire society. I mean, first it's your son, younger son, who leaves. Then my younger son sees that, and he leaves. Next thing you know, the whole youth group thinks it's OK <laughs> to just sell the land and leave. The society has to protect itself. And so this younger son, when I know about the Ketzatza ceremony, I am amazed at his courage. I figure he does not plan to return. 
He puts the shekels by his now fat wallet. He leaves the familiar. He's equipped to go into the unknown. But let's not judge him too harshly. Let, let's dare to give him the benefit of the doubt as he crosses boundaries and enters gentle territory where people are different, they talk different, they even have pork chops on their menu. I'm, I'm being gentle because this story of leaving home is a familiar story for many in our world today. So many in our world have been more or less forcibly displaced, are disconnected from their families, their traditions, their languages. Some have left home in pursuit of a better life. Some have left home because of war and conflict. It's sad fact that many people in our world Home is a place where government has little respect for human rights, where leaders grow rich while ordinary folks sink deeper and deeper into poverty. And so I am being gentle with this younger son who leaves home, making sure that I don't judge him too harshly, giving him the benefit of the doubt and even wishing him luck as he goes off to some far, far away land. The younger son goes off to this Gentile country. And although we are not, Jesus himself does not tell us how he spent his money. We have come to believe the elder son's testimony, which accused the brother of loose living or riotous living. The end of the story, the older son publicly accuses his younger brother of spending the money on harlots. But, but it surprises me because the older son's accusation must be taken with a grain of salt. After all, he's just arrived from the field and knows nothing. I think he just wants to exaggerate his brother's failures. What, what Jesus tells us is that the younger son spent all his money and fell on hard times. In ordinary circumstances, this younger son would naturally return home. But he knows he has broken the rules and he knows the ketzatsa ceremony awaits him should he dare return to the village. And so he does a desperate move to recover he looks for a, a paying job. Twice he tries to obtain one. First attempt is in feeding pigs in the faraway country, and the second game plan he vocalizes on the eve of his return. In the first plan, becoming a pig herder does not work. The text deliberately affirms no one gave him anything. As a pig herder, the younger son is fed but not paid. The first century Jewish reader knows the younger son must earn back the money he wasted if he has to avoid the ketzatsa ceremony. And having failed at his first try, he plans one last roll of the dice. He will go home, get job training, earn his way. To be accepted for that job training, he will need his father's endorsement. How will he convince his father to trust him one more time? He came to his senses, the text says. He came to, his, he, he came to himself, another translation says. And a modern translation puts it this way, he got smart. He, he came up with a prepared confession. Now I know, I know I'm going to annoy you when I say, Please, that confession is suspect. That confession is so suspect. Before you hurry and think he has repented, Bailey argues that the Jesus' audience, composed of Pharisees who knew the scripture well, they immediately hear this confession and they recognize 
This is a quotation from Pharaoh when he tries to manipulate Moses into lifting the plagues. After the ninth plague, Pharaoh finally agrees to meet Moses, and when Moses appears, Pharaoh gives this same speech. And everyone knows that Pharaoh is not repenting. He is simply trying to bend Moses's, Moses to his will. And the younger son's confession can be understood as attempting the same. He hopes to soften his father's heart. And so the younger son plans to offer his father a solution to the problem of their estrangement. He will work as a paid craftsman and be able to save money. He will not live at home for the present. He will live as a slave. And after maybe he has lost the money that, that he spent, maybe he thinks he can discuss reconciliation. He will save himself through the law. He, doesn't, he thinks no grace is necessary. He thinks he can manage. This younger son misunderstands that the lost money is not the real problem. He does not consider his father's broken heart. He, he does not realize the agony of rejected love that his father has endured. If we are dealing with a servant before, a master, his plan would be adequate. But the solution before us is a son and a father. And so the younger son's projected solution is inadequate. He steals his nerves. He is ready for the humiliation. He remembers the Ketsatsa ceremony, but he braces himself. He hopes that his humble speech will touch his father's heart. And so the younger son returns, empty handed. And his father, the old man, sees the figure in the distance. And the old man recognizes his son. The old man sees past that raggedy figure, stooped and limping, not having bathed for days, unkempt, so thin bones sticking out. His father sees past all that and he recognizes his son, the son he played catch with, the son that he had his bar mitzvah. He recognizes his son, and he ups and runs. Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way. The father does one of those things that patriots do not do. The father runs to his son. Great men never run in public, Aristotle said, but the father runs like a girl, <laughs> like a mother instead of a father. He runs and puts his arms around his son and kisses him right there on the road where everyone can see them. Is it affection? Yes. But it's protection as well. If the father can get to the son before the village does, then he can save his son from being cut off. And that reconciliation will cost him his honor, his greatness in others' eyes. And that is a price he is willing to pay for his son. 
to run like a woman to greet his son before anyone can treat him like a hired hand. Is it affection? Yes. But it is protection too. You see, when some of us say, talk about the blood of Jesus, what, what we're really trying to talk about is protection. I'm protected before the village got to me. And so Jesus tells the parable, it could easily have been a woman had two sons. Now, I grew up not so much bothered by the misleading title, but trying to figure out which of the two sons was the prodigal one. My friends and I have argued until the cows came home about which son was the prodigal son. In fact, I tell the story of how at the age of 22, I was finally engaged to be married to a fellow pastor and that was no feat because when I was 11, I declared I would be a nun and never be married. <laughs> and my grandmother and my mother were praying and on their knees day and night. So finally, when this young pastor proposed to me, my parents were elated. And they did. He was also from my tribe of Meru. And we went through the ritual where they bring the, you're engaged and they family of the groom brings to your, the bride's family a lamb, they brought the lamb, then they brought the honey, a drum of honey, and it was after the drum of honey that they had brought that my fiance and I went for a walk and we started talking about the prodigal son, and I do tell those who are getting married, do not ever discuss the prodigal son. <laughs> when I do my premarital counseling, I say to them, do not talk about the prodigal son. Because as this young, my fiance and I were walking, I, I said to him, who do you think is the prodigal one? And he said, what a dumb question. Of course, the younger son. And I said, well, I think it's the older son. And he said, I've never heard something that crazy. Of course not. And let's say we finished our walk. I got home and I said to my mom, the engagement is over. <laughs> and my mom said to me, we ate the honey. <laughs> and so when David proposed to me, the first thing I asked him is, what do you think of the, prodigal, the story of the prodigal son? He said, I don't really know it very well. I said, good, I'll marry you. <laughs> Which one of the two was the prodigal one? You know, when you think of the lost sheep, was that a prodigal sheep or the lost coin? Was that a prodigal coin? Are people who don't have a GPS, are they prodigal? <laughs> And then, to my surprise, it turns out that prodigal has nothing to do with lost and found. Prodigal is not even that bad of a thing. Forget the original Greek, I'm talking Webster's Dictionary, which says prodigal means extravagant, reckless, profuse, squandering, and wasteful. Prodigal also means abundant, bounteous, and lavish. Out of the word prodigal comes the word prodigious. People who are not prodigal are miserly, stingy, mean, and tight-fisted. When prodigal is inward-looking, it is sinful, as sinful as both the younger son and the older son who just think of me, 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 self-indulgent, greedy, and selfish. But look at prodigal. When prodigal is on another, like this prodigal father, this prodigal father, old man, running across the public square, that is prodigal, overwhelming in his forgiveness. The way he holds and laughs and cries, that is prodigal. Too much, extravagant, overflowing and constrained, forgetting the cultural codes overjoyed. 
that is heaping reckless helpings of mercy, doling out extravagant portions of love, that is prodigal. This story is not even about the sons. This story is about God. This God who is so prodigal in both his love and his protection that we who are invited to be the most God any might see, that we are prodigal in our love of others, that we run to the door when we see those who are excluded walking in, that we might get to them before the gossip gets to them, that we might reach them with a story before the made-up story happens, that we, we become this prodigal, this, this, from this God who is amazing, open-hearted, extravagant, beyond comprehension. If you must call it something, call it the parable of the prodigal father. And, and Jesus tells this story, a story without a title, without a label. It's really, in the end, the story about a family and how interconnected we are. Uh, finally, I want to tell you an African story, um, the African story of how we are connected. Story says that um, a rat was living in the walls of a farmer's house, and one day rat was going about his rat business, and through the hole in the wall he spied the farmer and his wife opening a package. And he paused to watch, and in the package was a rat trap. A rat trap. In a panic, the rat called the farm animals. And he kept saying, rat trap in the house, rat trap in the house. He called the goat and the cow and the chicken, rat trap in the house, rat trap in the house, he kept saying. Uh, uh, and we told the cow, listen, the goat, listen, the chicken, listen. And the chicken scratched around a bit and finally said, well, brother rat, I'm standing here and I'm thinking to myself, rat trap in the house, what's that got to do with a chicken? I've never heard of a chicken getting caught in a rat trap. I don't see what it has to do with me. None of my business and the chicken walked off. The goat nodded at what the chicken was saying, and, and he was more understanding. He said, Brother Rat, you take care now. We'll be praying for you, okay? <laughs> Remember, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. You take care now. And the cow chewed the cud and finally said, it's like, it's like I'm like so like confused. I'm like, OMG, I'm just so confused. And like, oh my, you know, it's like cows and rat traps. It's like, I'm too big for the rat trap. I mean, I'm like, duh, and walked off. And we are told in the middle of the night, they suddenly up and the scream, suddenly the lights go on, the farmer dashes off. He, what has happened is a snake has wandered into the house, gotten into the rat trap. Farmer's wife reaches over, snake bites her. Farmer rushes wife to the hospital. Sad, sad story, wife dies. It's an African story, so people die. If it was an American story, she would be badly injured, but she died. <laughs> we gotta just, <laughs> she dies. Farmer comes back, comes back, and farmer is so sad, and he's in shock, and when people are in shock, they must always be given fresh chicken soup. And, and that, by the next day, so many of the family are coming to comfort and to do the planning, They're, they have to serve something, and they have goat for a meal. And the day of the funeral, so many people show up, even the bishop shows up, and they have ribs, and they have the beef stew, and all because of the rat trap. Brothers and sisters, we are such family. When you hear what's going on in a parish, or what a fellow pastor is being treated like, rat trap in the house, rat trap in the house, 
rat trap in the house. What's it got to do with you, rat trap in the house? If you hear what's going on in Tucson, rat trap in the house. When you hear what's going on in Kenya or Darfur, when you hear of Haiti, rat trap in the house. Rat trap in the house. And Jesus tells us the story of a man who had two sons. In the end, it's a story about family. And if you must label it, then it is a story about a prodigal father. Thanks be to God. Amen.